Welcome everybody, this is Two EdTech Guys Take Questions and Share Cool Stuff. Richard and I are ready to have some fun with you guys today. And even before we get to the reminder slide, I'm going to turn on the captions. Ah, so some days are, are like that. Oh, I already knew. Oh, good. All right. So, ah, very important here. Next week, my friends, Richard and I are taking the week off. Actually, I have, I have a thing to do in, in another part of the country, so I will be doing that. Uh, Richard will be meditating on top of a mountain, a mountain thinking about his three-year-old in the office. Uh, and so we will see you in two weeks, uh, but but you will be able to register when you get the email that I will send you, you'll be able to, assuming you registered, that you will get the email to go to the page and register for the November 5th show, which you should certainly do. Thank you for joining us. We uh, appreciate that you would take part uh, in our, our little little corner of the week where, where we entertain uh, you know each other, at least, you know, with, with, with what we think is funny and, and stuff that we think might even be useful to you. A special thanks goes out to all of the cool people uh, in Merit 20 and the other programs at the Craft Center for Innovation at Foothill College in Los Altos Hills, California. And of course, thanks, to big, thanks big time to Free Tech for Teachers. And Richard, if someone's like, give me the one sentence on what Free Tech for Teachers is, do it. It is my musings on cool things I find on the web all the time, how to use educational technology in your classroom Coming up now on 13 years of almost daily blog posts. Near daily blog posts. That would be NDBP, by, as the government counts it. All right. Yeah. Very cool stuff. Um, and, and by the way, Judith White, you forgot to register, but you found the way in. I'm curious. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, let's keep going. So uh, this is also brought to you by Next Vista for Learning, my own little nonprofit. What is that? Glad you asked. It's a library of videos by and for teachers and students everywhere, free to use, free to contribute to, free to download from, all for a screen, all for a student audience, all screened content, my own little attempt to save the universe from ignorance, one creative video at a time. You know, the, the captioning almost got that right. Okay, let's keep going. So uh, later today, Activities across grade levels. Susan Stewart and I are joined by the wildly cool Cass Pereira, and we're going to talk about gamified learning. She has like all this experience with class craft, and will tell us about that and the usual thing, you know, at, at different grade levels. That is at 3.30 Pacific, 6.30 Eastern, uh, and that's probably like uh, 9.30 England time or something. 7.30 Atlantic. No, seven Atlantic. Sorry. Okay. That works. Se seven thirty Atlantic. Seven thirty Atlantic. Seven New Brunswick time. Something like that. Is New Brunswick a half hour off? Is it New Brunswick or is it? Uh... That's India, man. India is a half hour off. No, part of Canada is half hour off too. Anyway. There, there are people watching this going, get on with it. All right, so here we are. <laughs> um, so what we do is we take questions and then we share cool stuff. It's, it's, it's all in the title. So with that, Richard, man, start us off. What is the first question for us this week? Oh, our first question this week is, I want to make a video of me writing something. If it's animated, then even better. After which, I want to add some audio explanation of what has been written. Can you suggest an app for this, Desmond? So I wrote back to Desmond to ask for clarification. I have not heard back, but if you mean truly an app, like an iPad app or an Android app, I would go with something like explain everything or show me. Either one of those are great to provide a whiteboard where you can draw and you can talk at the same time to explain your writing. And you know, one of the ways you might do that is even include you know, an image of a document or upload a document that you then draw on top of. You do a similar thing with the Seesaw app, uh, seesaw.me. In fact, the seesaw.me, the web version of Seesaw, you can do that right in your web browser as well. So that's uh, one way to go about it. Now, if you want to animate it, then you've got some other options like using some of the cool tools that are available in iMovie, or you could use something like uh, stop motion. What is it? Cloud stop motion, cloud stop motion would be an option for that as well. So that's what I'll look at. Uh, you know, think, think of the ones you just mentioned, Richard, and toss them into the chat and we'll, we'll get them into the links as well. 
um, there are, you know, there, there are, are ones out there where if what you're talking about is, you know, just kind of like what looks like a hand doing it, uh, you know, there, there are uh, non-free options on that front, like Doodly, D-O-O-D-L-Y, mm -hmm. I know does that. I haven't used it, but it's out there. Um, and so, you know, there, you know, Powtoon does, does some stuff like that as well. So, you, so you've got, you got some options as you think about, uh, you know, kind of the different things you might try. Now, Powtoon does have a free option. So let's yes, get do. that in the chat as well for you. Uh, I see that Richard has explained everything there and showme.com and I just put in powtoon.com. So, so you, you, you got some options on that, uh, but uh, we'd, ha we'd have to learn a little bit more to know for sure what it is you're telling us about, but all good. All right. How about a second question? A second one came from Amanda. Um, I, can't seem, I can't seem to find a tutorial for how to have yourself talking video in a Google slide or a video on the main page. Many of your tutorials are like this. Can you point me in the right direction? I'd appreciate it. Uh, so I use Screencast-O-Matic for almost all of my videos. But I also like Loom, L-O-O-M, Loom, which has an education version that is completely free and gives you all kinds of cool tools, uh, including the option to password protect your videos and also a brand new feature to see how long people have watched your videos for. So check out Loom.com. That's a good option because it will give you that for lack of a better term, disembodied head floating in the bottom right or bottom left corner of your screen, if you like that. And then what I do, if you want to use it with Google Slides, I just make my Google Slides full screen and launch the Loom video recorder right on my, so that I can have my disembodied head and I can still toggle through my slides. So that's, a, that's the approach that I take to it. There are lots of other tools out there, but Loom is a really good option. Um, and two weeks ago, we actually talked about Canva. That was my cool tool. Uh, Canva, if you have the education version of Canva, which again is free for teachers, if you have a verifiable email, uh, education email address, will let you record your slides with again, kind of like your circular disembodied head floating in the bottom left corner of the, of the screen. Ruth. I'm a big fan myself of Screencastify. I feel like we mentioned this every every few episodes, I mean, but but they're great tools, right? Yeah. You know, the thing the thing about it is that if you are if you are using one of these, you you can be narrating slides, of course, but you could also be going down the page and saying, look, and it talks about this here, and then there's one of these things, and then look at all these numbers. How many threes do you three? Or just whatever, right? I mean, just different things kind of keep appearing, but but you can use you can use screencasting tools to do a lot. Right, you know, you can shift among tabs if you're just screencasting. You know, your browser window. You can fly back and forth around your your desktop. I mean, it's just if you if you haven't tried out screencasting, you really should because it's one of those things that I think it, it's surprising to people just how easy it can be. And I'll give one other option that one of my students did this week, mm. and that was he used Wee Video, recorded his entire audio track with Wee Video and then uploaded his Google Slides as individual images that he then just synced up to his audio track. Uh, so, sounds like a lot of work to me. <laughs> yeah, it's not the approach that I would have taken, but it's like I gave my kids about an hour to work on some videos to explain a, a handful of different topics that they could pick from mm -hmm. and let them go. and. He was in the back closet. I could hear him talking and recording and he came out and that's what he had done. And I was like, hey, it works. You know, he didn't think it was too much work. So more power to him. So, well, I mean, that's the key shout thing. Out my, shout out to my student, Matt Miller, for that awesome uh, little tip. That is cool. I mean, so, so, you know, as a reminder, it's less about the tool and more about showing learning, right? So this is one thing when you're talking about yourself making stuff, but but if you're giving kids the opportunity to make videos about what they've done, it, give them the chance to use whatever. As long as they as long as they hand you a link, and you click on the link and you can see it, then you're in the right space. So speaking of the right space, 
I believe there's some cool stuff in this space which would rightly belong to you. So, so talk to us about photo scissors. So photo scissors is one of many tools that are like it. Uh, what it does is it will automatically or auto magically remove the background from your images. So, you know, let's say you have, a, you know, a, a picture of you in front of your house, but you want to make sure that you don't give away too much information about your house, upload the picture, and it will strip out the background for you. But you can also go in and use their actual scissor tool and specify which parts you want to take out. Right? So you can leave some of the background in and some of the background out. What I like to do with this is I make cutouts. Right? So you can make cutouts of yourself or make cutouts of you know, your cats, Rushton. Make cutouts of your cats. Because how often do you take pictures of your cats where there's nothing else in the background, right? So you take, take that tool, make a cutout of your cat, then you can put your cat into all kinds of other cool places by putting them on top of Google Slides or on top of a PowerPoint slide or on top of any other image, you know, layer them on top of each other. So it's cool for that purpose. You do these little cutouts, but then you take those cutouts, put them on top of something like, let's say I have a, I did a cutout of me and my daughter in her backpack when she was a little bit smaller, like in the, the walking around with your kid in your, on your back backpack, not like, you know, not like my book bag, but you know, that I had in sixth grade. Um, so that, right. And I cut us out and I put us in front of, uh, put us in front of Mount Everest. Yep. And then I did another one with my dog, with me and my dog, and we were in front of Buckingham Palace. So, you know, kind of cool stuff. And just for reference, by the way, uh, this is Lola right here. You know, just one of those moments where, you know, like hanging close and, and just keeps head butting you and looks up like, oh, and I'm like, wow, you're my best friend with four legs. You're awesome. All right. So those of you who needed to see one of my two cats, there you go. All right. Oh. Right. Well, cool, Richard. It's, it's always good to get like a like another good graphics tool, something that's easy to use as well. I mean, and how how much work did you have to do to kind of get? Do you have to register? Can you do it without registering? No, you can do it without registering. Okay. Do it if you register. You get to like you know save your images and you know that sort of stuff. But you don't have to register. And, oh, you get you can get it. The question was in how do you get it? It's mm -hmm. at photoscissors.com. Yes. So. You're, you're getting that in the chat right now, yes? I am doing that in the chat right now. It's photoscissors.com. I should point out for my PowerPoint users, PowerPoint has the same feature built into it, although it's not quite as refined. Uh huh. All right, maybe in a future episode, we'll, we'll, we'll actually take a few moments for you to show that. That'd, that'd be cool. If, it, if, there's, if there's a shout out for that, just sing out. Speaking of shout outs, Sonia also has a tabby named Lola. You know, I mean, dogs and cats are both great. You know, Richard's more of a dog person. I'm more of a cat person. Uh, yeah, do dogs are wonderful. Cats, purr. And there's just something, something sacred about a cat purring in the Just Saying department. I'll bet we've got more questions. We do have more questions, and they're not about cats and dogs. Um, quick, quick one from Carl, uh, who's my colleague down the hall. Is there a search function in Google Classroom? There is not. Um, but you can use control F or command F and do a search on the page for anything. Uh, this came up because we're getting to that part of the year where a lot of us have a lot of things in Google Classroom now and we're tired of scrolling. And my, my colleague Carl is very tired of scrolling and wanted... <laughs> And, and thinks I have a, like a direct line to the Google product development team. I don't, by the way, I mm. don't. Uh, I know one person who works at Google now. Used to know a lot more, but one person now. I so uh, no, there's not a search function in there, but you can use control F or command F and do a search for a keyword or just a great part of a keyword. I, I will add in the not particularly satisfying uh, extra answer category, 
that this is a really good argument for naming your assignments uh, distinctive things, right? So, so whatever it is, if, you're, if your assignment is called homework number 24, you just lost the chance to do control F slash command F on that page and find what you wanted. On the other hand, if it's, uh, if, if it's you know, Doppler effect lab or something like that, then, then, now, you, then now you can find it. So, so how you name your assignments in, in classroom falls into the big whopping deal category. Yeah, I have a rule that uh, no one is allowed to turn in untitled document. So, so, so if they do, is it, is it just not accepted or do you, do you ritually make fun of the student in class? How does that work out? Uh, I just ignore it. <laughs> I turn it in. No, you didn't. They didn't. <laughs> no, no, it's right there. It's right in front of you. I don't see it. No. Right. I also have, I, I also used to have the rule that if you just called it homework, I would ignore it as well. Does it still happen? Um, it ha will happen once or twice. And my students will go, oh, yeah. they'll grumble and then they'll go, okay, I'll change, change the file name. I, turn, I change the file name, turn it in, Mr. Byrne. Okay, good, I'll read it. <laughs> Only happens once or twice, and then it's all done. <laughs> I'll I'll add to that that um, if you are sending someone an email, I would encourage you not to put in the subject line question. <laughs> Unless you're sending it to me. Well, I mean, I, I, actually, you know, if it's question for the webinar, I mean, that's that's totally different. Right? Totally, but but if, but if you're like, you know, what time are we meeting on Friday? Time for Friday meeting. <laughs> yeah, choice right. for the subject line. Oh. Some, some of you, some of you are out there going, dude, you are just OCD. Others are like, preach it, brother. All right. So what, whatever, wherever you are on that spectrum, it just if you're writing to me, actually, I mean, I'm going to get a bunch of emails right now. People like, question. I, I know I'm, I know I'm annoying them. Ah, ah. Anyway, speaking oh. of, uh, but, but Russ, cool that things. that is a perfect opportunity to to bring up one of my four favorite, one of my four favorite next Vista videos, emailing your teacher with Captain Communicator. Oh, heck yeah. Great video. I just put it in the link. I, I just put the link in the chat. Yeah. Yes. So, 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 you know, why, why is this, why is this video so cool? All right. So now this does get us back to, you know, kind of what's going on generally with, <laughs> I keep trying to go there. Uh, what, what's going on generally with, um, with, with student created videos. But, but the beauty of videos like this is that they're just kind of simple and fun enough, right? Are, are they the kind of things where you're like, oh my God, Oscar material? No, but, but might a student watch it and, and like a message sink in? Yes, which is sort of the idea. So, you know, if you're kind of into the idea of having kids uh, create videos that'll help, you know, you can do this kind of thing. And this one, of course, been around over 16,000 views, by the way, which is, which is no small thing on our site. There he is. There he is. Ah, this is the light. Somebody's emailing their teacher and they need my help. Great stuff. All right. Oh, go, 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 the, go all the way to the end, Russian. Go all the way to the end of it. All the way to the end. Right about there. Yeah, where, where, yeah, where he talks about the closing for the email. Oh, you mean? Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Captain Communicator. Anytime, student. Hey, remember to never use the word love as a closing when writing to a teacher because she is not your relative and that would be weird. Because she is not your relative, and that would be weird. Words to live by. That's my favorite part of the whole video. Thank you, Captain mm -hmm. Communicator. All right, cool. Third time's a charm. Here's the cool stuff. So my my little shindig today is about web captioner. Now you're like, well, what what's the issue, right? I mean, you've got cap you get captions going on in your slides. Yeah, and every time I go to another page, it it stops. And by the way, anybody who's reading the captions, sorry about that. However. Uh, it is it is a better than nothing tool. What we've got here, however, web captioner is this is this beautifully simple thing. This guy just kind of put this together. 
this person put this together in his or her spare time. And so you can say start captioning, right? So it starts thinking about it. It's listening a bit. Hi, we are now captioning what is being said on the screen. How cool is this? Now we have no punctuation, but sometimes in life you don't need it, perhaps. Um, now, what's the point there? So if what you're doing is, and where'd my captions go? All right, let's see. All right, uh, let's bring that up again. So what the point being that if you if you have like a uh, you know a couple of a couple of different uh, web web windows, right? You have a couple of different windows open, and so you can have a set of slides up here. You could have captioner under it, and then that way, if you go to another thing, you could kind of have them both, but you'd have to be sharing your entire screen. Nevertheless, it's a free tool that's out there, and it's kind of nice. So if what you're doing is you're just talking to students, you can toss something like that up there and use it, and it's uh, you know takes up the full screen. Kind of nice. Now, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of this, Richard. Uh, any extras that you would add on, on Web Captioner or, or other tools like it? Uh, no, but I will add that Zoom has announced that they are going to start adding in a native captioning option. You know, I am, I am seriously ready for that. Um, and it, and you know, like, I thought, I thought they were going to be pulling this out in August. And so good, good to know that it's on the way, because when we used it as a part of the, uh, the, the, the Zoom Topia or whatever they called themselves, right? Yeah. Like it was a really good tool that we were using. So it was like, why, why not get this out there? So y'all know. All right. There are more questions. There are more questions. Um, and we may have some answers. Perfect. Now we're getting into the, the trickier ones. Okay, uh, I have a student, oh, sorry, uh, this is from David. I have a question that hopefully you have some tips on. Our school has a large number of ELL students who are generally phase two or three in the same classes as fluent English speakers. And this makes for a difficult lesson as the ELLs generally require constant attention at the detriment of the fluent English speakers. The question is, are you aware of any technology that would, that would assist in simplifying text, i.e reducing the lexile level, translating from English to Chinese and back again, or basically anything that can be used to bridge the gap between the language issue. Many thanks, David. So I have a few things, um, but this is more your realm of expertise, Rustin, in terms of working with ELL and other languages. Um, so, so I'll stay... I'll start with a real simple one. Do that. Summarize this.com does a fairly good job of boiling down long web pages into uh, smaller chunks. Does a, fair, a pretty good job of removing phrasal verbs. Uh, so if there's a lot of phrasal verbs in, it, in an article, uh, it does a fairly decent job of removing those things from it. And you, so you just paste in, yeah? Yeah, you just paste in. So you have to copy and paste the, the text. Now, if you if you have a short chunk, like if you have one paragraph, it doesn't do anything. But if you have, let's say, you know, I don't know, a thousand characters, a thousand words, then it actually will will work. So there's that option. Uh, Microsoft Translator, uh, when you're using PowerPoint, does give you the option for like fifty something different languages. So that may be an option if you're speaking to the class and you turn on that feature in PowerPoint. Uh, it's the web version of PowerPoint. And so you can speak in English and it will translate what you're saying into whatever language of the audience that the audience chooses. So you can try that. Uh, those would be my, my, my two recommendations uh, again. I mean, never really taught ELL myself. So what do you think? So um, obviously Google Translate's an option. There's a lot of material there as well, you know? Um, and, you know, just depending on the language and depending on the sophistication of the content, it, it may do a great job. So, you know, you, you never know. Now, uh, I, I do want to speak to the idea of ELLs, you know, giving them attention to the detriment of, of the fluent English speakers. 
All right. So, so it, it is, it, it, yes, you are right. It is complicating to have groups of students in class, some of whom have uh, limited English. However, uh, they're bringing a lot to the table as well, right? And so let, let, let's not ignore that. Um, but, but I think one of the best pieces of advice I can give you is that when you think about, about the content that you bring to your students, uh, what, what, are, what are the summaries? Right? Like, what are the main things you want to say? Is that something that you can put in a quick little screencast where, where you have two, three, four, five minute summaries of the class? Can that become actually part of a flipped lesson? Because your, your ELL students will, will be doing great being able to go back and listen to it multiple times, especially if you're doing something like using a captioning tool so that they can see it as well, because you can get used to speaking in such a way that it does a good job. Of, of catching uh, you know, your sentences, sure enough. But you're gonna have students who are fluent speakers who are going to benefit from that as well. So one of the many benefits of, of flipping, flipping your classroom, you know, that, that kind of instruction, uh, is that you are creating resources that can help a lot of kids. Uh, so Richard's uh, suggestion that you check out uh, some of the things that are there you know, related to Larry Ferrellazzo's work, you know, good, good suggestions, well, that's in the chat. Um, but th those would be the, the big things that come to mind for me. Richard, I bet we can get one more question in. Let's do it. Yeah, one more. And I just put the link into the Microsoft Translator for PowerPoint. Uh, it's a little add, it's a little add-in you can use in PowerPoint, and uh, it's, a, it's a great little great little tool. Um, so let's do the last question that we have here. Right. And this is a tricky one from Kim who says, do you have any recommendations for getting videos of teachers teaching and documents, graphic organizers, et cetera, to our offline or limited internet users? Any great ideas for getting the work they complete back to the teachers? We have a team of teacher assistants that are going to each teacher's folders and downloading from Google Drive. It's, compli it's a complicated time consuming process that's not yielding results on the student's end. We're hearing from guardians and parents that it's hard too. Are there, is there any way Google Sites can be used offline or something else? Uh, K1 students are one-to-one -one iPads and second 12th all have Chromebooks. They are Google for Ed School. So that is a lot of questions and a, I don't have a ready-made answer other than we're doing the same thing in our in our school district where we we do i live in a rural district uh, you know we have close to 90 percent of kids on free or reduced lunch so you know you know we have a lot of kids who don't have internet access or reliable internet access at home we have uh, teachers guidance counselors teacher aides we call them ed techs in maine even some principals who are literally driving to houses and dropping off USB drives and picking up USB drives and you know other packets of, of materials. So uh, Google Sites does not work offline. No, Google Sites does not work offline. Google Docs works offline. Uh, all at Google Docs, Google Slides, uh, Google Sheets, those all work offline. However, you've got to enable that feature when you're online. And then you can download those items as PDFs if you need to. So if you want to have them offline, you know, if you want to have continued offline access or you want to, uh, you know, convert it into a different file that doesn't require any kind of syncing up, you can convert those into PDFs and, and do it that way. So I don't have a good ready-made ready answer for you from, unfortunately. I will say that my friend, Dr. Beth Holland, who is uh, the Digital Equity Project Manager for COSIN, Consortium of School Networking, I think that's the acronym, COSIN, uh, has been working on a lot of materials related to these kinds of questions. So you may want to check out what she's doing at COSIN, uh, COSIN.org. I'll put that link in the chat, and she may have some uh, some better answers. In fact, that's what I recommended to Cam. We should check out what she's doing, um, or check out what what Kosin is doing, and you know what Kosin um, what Kosin has around that. It's Kosin C O S N dot 
org. So. Yes. Yeah. I, I would, I would add um, that if you have a lot of students who, uh, who have limited internet or no internet at home, that is an issue. Right. I mean, just this morning, I showed a video to my creative solutions for the global good uh, students uh, of, of a piece that Soul Pancake had put out three years ago uh, on uh, the homework gap. And, you know, what what is, what is it like when when some students have access to, to information online and others don't? And it, simplistic in some ways, but but still a pretty good a pretty good addressing of the issue. Now, given that one of the things that a school or a district should be doing is checking with like local cable companies and local internet providers and saying, can we work with you to get some kind, some kind of something available to our kids who, who have issues with getting online? Uh, because it, it, there, there's kind of no way around, uh, I mean, people are gonna lose out regardless, right? So those who don't have access are gonna lose out. If you simplify assignments down to the, folk, down to the point where um, you know, it doesn't hurt not to have it, then, you know, your students are going a lot slower than students in the next school or district over where they're, they're flying with the stuff that's available online. So, so the actual hard work of, of connecting with internet service providers and talking to them about providing hotspots for families in need or something is, is something that, that is worth doing. And, and a lot of schools and districts have done that successfully. So we would, we would encourage you to think along those lines as well. All right, everybody, welcome back. As in moments ago, actually about 30 minutes, 25 minutes ago, computer totally froze and that was the end of that session, my bad. Uh, however, all of you who are live got to see uh, a fine finish by Richard. Richard, you rock and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But this will be the, the finish to the recording because can't let that not happen. So thank you guys for joining us today. I hope you got uh, plenty out of our, uh, our attempts to give you insights and ways that you can use tech to make good things happen and to fix annoying problems that might be vexing you in some fashion. But do take care of yourself. If you're going to do a good job of taking care of the kids, you've got to spend some time taking care of yourself. Now, every Thursday, I welcome you to sign up for my newsletter. If you have not done so, then you're going to get all kinds of good treats in the newsletter, the cool videos that I share, uh, the things that you might want to read or try, the projects we got, the ideas that we, all kinds of things in the news, the monthly newsletter. And so feel free to sign up. Why might you want to do that? Well, in addition to all the good content, you might win a Starbucks card for doing so. Ah, that's pretty cool, huh? All right. Now, uh, I hope you will take a look at nextvista.org. Uh, you'll get these slides as well uh, as a function of going back to the webinars page at Next Vista. I'll, I always email the people who are registered for this and, and let them know, hey, the recording's available and here's the links and here are the slides. So all of that is available to you. Uh, there is material at my blog, Inspiring Improvement. You can click on the links to get to that. Uh, or you can like take a look at some of the writing I've done. You can also find loads of good stuff at the weekly newsletter from practicaledtech.com. That's Richard's compliment to free tech for teachers. Uh, and he has done so many good tutorial videos that he has on his uh, his YouTube channel. Give that a look. You can get there easily by bit.ly.com slash RMB YouTube. Great stuff to know. Here's his email, Richard at burn.media, and you can find him on the Twitterverse at, at RMBurn. Our next show will be Thursday, November the 5th. So that's two weeks away. We're skipping a week, and we hope that you will join us for that, and that will be included in the email as well. Thank you for joining us as always. And I hope that uh, somewhere along the way, you got an idea that will be useful to you and maybe to inspire some kid who's been needing something a little different. Take care. We hope to see you in two weeks.